Earlier this month, uh, MTC and ABAD released uh, the draft of Plan Bay Area uh, 2040, and over the next month, we're going to be seeking uh, feedback from policymakers and the public uh, on the plan. Uh, the plan also incorporates uh, an action plan component. Um, we also recently, a couple weeks ago, released the environmental impact report uh, for the plan. So what I, would, what I wanted tonight is just provide you all an, an update on the process, uh, give you a sense of how the document uh, is laid out and focus a bit on the uh, action plan. So a bit about the plan itself. Uh, plan Bay Area 2040 is, is the second iteration of a combined uh, regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategy. As many of you know, we've been doing uh, RTPs in this region since the dawning of time. Um, and they are uh, primarily a federal requirement uh, that we fulfill. Um, so it's, it's a long-range, uh, fiscally constrained uh, transportation plan. Uh, but at the same time now, we're also blessed with the responsibility uh, to combine that, combine that plan with a sustainable community strategy via SB 375. Um, and uh, what that has us do is essentially uh, do a forecast of development pattern for housing and jobs. Um, basically find a way to adequately house the region's population uh, to do that also while achieving uh, greenhouse gas targets uh, for the region. But the plan is uh, essentially a blueprint um, for forecasting development uh, and transportation uh, over a long range time. So we know uh, that the region is uh, in an economic boom, um, and uh, it's historically extreme. Um, and this has uh, increased prosperity for many Bay Area residents. Uh, at the same time, we are faced with affordability challenges, which have, have gotten quite worse and then exacerbated by a lack of housing and production. And what this slide points out is just uh, generally, uh, from a regional perspective, how we've done on housing and jobs over the last five years or so. And, uh, the stark picture that's painted here is, is we've created a lot more jobs than we have housing um, in this region. And, and it's been more or less acute, depending on where you are in the region. Um, from a regional perspective, we've, we've built one housing unit for every new jobs that we've created between 2011 and 2015. Um, in the Bayside cities and towns, which is the area in the map uh, in, in blue, um, it's been the more acute one housing unit for every 15 jobs created in the inland coastal delta cities and towns, about one housing unit for every three jobs created. And that problem has translated into new pressures um, across our transportation system. Uh, public transit is at uh, crush capacity levels. And many parts of our system um, are facing that. And uh, even compared to the peak of the last boom uh, in the year 2000, congested delay on our regional freeways has gone up by 50%. And, and there's, a, there's obviously a pattern there in terms of people regionally uh, living uh, further from where they work. In terms of the road so far um, on the planning process, we, we have done two rounds of public outreach uh, so far. It's been roughly a two-year process uh, to date, and we're embarking now on this third round of public outreach, which I'll talk about a bit in a second. Um, and uh, Board Member Eklund brought up the Mill Valley event uh, that's happening, and that is part of our workshop and open house series that we're doing in every county uh, across the region. Um, back in November, um, we adopted uh, the preferred scenario for the plan that was adopted by uh, the MTC Commission uh, and the uh, ABAG uh, Executive Board, and, and essentially that laid out the forecast of development pattern for housing and jobs. The, the plan document sort of uses that as a foundation um, and kind of weave a narrative around the forecasted development pattern. Uh, but uh, the plan does is consistent with that final preferred scenario that was adopted uh, in November. So just a bit about some of the numbers in terms of housing, jobs, uh, and transportation uh, in the plan. Um, we do forecast growth of 820,000 new households in the region between the years of 2010 and 2040. Uh, it is a focused development pattern, which is consistent with uh, the last iteration of Plan Bay Area. Uh, it is focused primarily in the big three cities of San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. 46% of the housing growth uh, over that period is located in the big three cities, about a third of the growth uh, located in the so-called Bayside communities, and 21% in the, in the coastal and delta areas. 
in green, and perhaps uh, more importantly, uh, in terms of where that growth is situated, about 77% of the housing growth uh, is located in priority development areas, the PDAs, which of course are, are locally nominated uh, areas for growth, about 23% uh, outside of the PDAs. Fairly similar story for uh, jobs, uh, about 43% of the growth in the big three cities, 40% in Bayside, 17% Coastal Delta. Um, in terms of jobs, we see about 55% located in PDAs and 45% uh, outside of those areas. So a bit too specific, uh, specific to Marin County. Um, the draft plan's growth pattern envisions roughly 8,400 new households and 13,000 uh, new jobs. And again, as I mentioned, this is uh, consistent with the preferred scenario that was adopted uh, back in November. Um, there were changes made in the period between the draft preferred scenario and the final preferred scenario, so I wanted to uh, acknowledge that. Um, and you know, kind of moving there, we, we did work pretty intensely across the region with local jurisdictions, with planning directors. Um, we held meetings in all nine counties with planning directors, and we also uh, had one-on-one -on -one meetings with folks um, to kind of run through some of the assumptions for the numbers. Um, and if there were areas that we needed to improve on, there were some assumptions that we needed to make or build in. Um, we uh, work to accommodate those requests. On the transportation side, uh, this is um, consistent with the last plan, or is it a fix it first um, plan? 90% of our transportation revenues are dedicated to operating, maintaining, and modernizing uh, the transportation system. And I think you'll find that's consistent with, with the new state money that just appeared via SB1. For transportation, the emphasis of that money there, again, is on basic first for highways uh, and transit. Um, and, and that is because there's a massive need out there to really modernize the existing system that we have. <clears throat> um, with a $303 billion revenue envelope between 2010 and 2040, um, we do invest about $31 billion of that amount in terms of expanding the system. And by expanding the system, um, we're referring to adding capacity um, on our highway system or extending uh, fixed guideway transit. And we work very closely um, with the Transportation Authority um, in, in terms of our call for projects process uh, for the transportation investments. Um, and you know, some of the projects that are fiscally constrained in the plan, I know these projects are not new to you. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that I think um, in, in large part, uh, most of the big transportation priorities uh, up here in Marin um, are included in the fiscally constrained plan. Uh, <coughs> so I wanted to turn uh, a bit to our um, goals and targets uh, for the plan. Um, when we, we start out this, this planning process, we adopt goals and targets uh, through our commission, and um, they are very ambitious. Um, and we go through a fairly long process of figuring out what those are. Um, ultimately, the plan met five of our ambitious performance targets. We moved in the right direction on four others um, and moved in the wrong direction um, on four others. And I think to kind of sum it up fairly crudely, um, the plan does a good job in terms of protecting the environment and open space. Um, it does a pretty good job in terms of moving in the right direction in transportation. And, uh, but generally, where the plan is falling short is really um, affordability measures. Um, that's a big part of it. It's the equity measures and affordability measures of housing. And that really motivated um, by our commission and executive board um, a move towards creating, creating an action plan for Plan Bay Area, with the question really being, you know, what are the other policies and planning efforts that we need to undertake to kind of move these targets in the right direction? Um, and again, most of that effort is centered on the affordability challenges that we see. So I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. Just in terms of the way the plan is laid out, um, there are five sections to the plan. Uh, there are 16 supplemental reports to the plan. Um, good cure for insomnia, if you're into that. Um, they're, they're quite technical, but if, if you're interested in sort of the detail and the methodology of how we put together um, the plan, take a look at that, and then the environmental impact uh, report is also on the street. Um, we are accepting comments on the draft documents, both the, the plan itself and the environmental impact report uh, through June. So this is an overview of the plan document with focus here mostly on the action plan. Um, again, this was to acknowledge that the plan does move in the wrong direction on some of those affordability uh, metrics. And so what the plan, uh, the action plan does is propose specific short-term actions focused on areas where the plan falls short. It's 
So those areas where really affordability, displacement risk, access to jobs, and actually road maintenance, which is also slightly moving in the wrong direction. Although we think that the passage of uh, the loose state money might actually help us out with that. But the three prongs to the action plan are housing, uh, economic develop development, and also a focus on uh, resilience. So in terms of the draft action plan for housing, um, obviously there are affordability problems and we're focused on production, preservation, um, and also solving the displacement crisis uh, that is uh, facing the region in certain areas. And uh, so moving through the housing action plan, we're really talking about advancing some funding and legislative solutions for housing. Uh, MTC and ABAG um, are assembling uh, sort of a new blue ribbon committee to deal with uh, housing. Uh, it's called CASA, the Committee for Affordable and Sustainable um, Accommodations. And part of what the CASA group is going to do is, is look at kind of our, our regional legacy of leadership, um, as they call it. We, we have a history here in this region of self-help, um, whether it's, it's dealing with the transportation issues um, that we face and then raising our own money to deal with those issues, or uh, the stewardship we've had on the environmental side and protecting our open space. The, the thought behind the, the CASA effort is really, is there a similar effort that we can move forward as a region to deal with the housing affordability crisis? So that's really an effort that's going to be kicking off uh, in the next month or two. And so we're all going to be watching that very closely um, to see what that comes up with. But essentially the plan, in terms of the action plan, is calling to advance funding and legislative solutions that kind of come out uh, of that process. The other piece of affordability is obviously jobs um, and economic development. And so we are recommending a, a few pieces here. Uh, ABAG's been working uh, very closely over the last couple of years on uh, a uh, economic, comprehensive economic development strategy for the region, which would potentially uh, poise the region for federal funding around economic uh, or workforce development. I think that's a pretty good idea. Um, and it's also in the action plan we're going to move forward with that. So strengthening middle wage job career paths, um, potentially in some parts of the region, preserving and enhancing our existing industrial land. So this is really all about is still career pathways and middle wage jobs. Third piece of the action plan is uh, resilience. And, and really when we talk about resilience, we, we talk mostly about the way we can proactively deal with the hazards that we face, um, whether it's earthquakes or sea level rise uh, or issues with climate change or drought. Um, but you know, resilience is also becoming an overarching framework in which we're doing our plan. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that. But in terms of resilience, it is a crowded space out there institutionally in terms of sort of who does what. With resilience, we are proposing in the plan to develop a regional governance strategy for how we deal with climate adaptation projects. We can new funding sources for adaptation and resilience. Um, are needed. Uh, we also think across a lot of the these actions, whether it's housing, economic development, or the environment, and resilience. Um, that the regional agencies can step up and make their assistance to local governments, their technical assistance, um, a bit more coherent, efficient, and effective. Um, and so I think that's something that the upcoming staff integration at NPC and ABAC that we're hoping is to work on to really make the, the technical assistance meaningful. We have to beat that. So our outreach uh, schedule for the plan um, is quite robust. Uh, we're doing nine briefings of elected officials, one in each county. That's what we're doing right now. So it's just one of nine. Um, four meetings with community-based organizations around the region, uh, we're doing three public hearings on the draft plan uh, and EIR, and then nine open houses, uh, which um, are kicking off in May. And um, we mentioned the, the event again happening in Mill Valley. It's a Saturday event, uh, May 20th at 8.30. And I think the idea there is that we'll, we'll have workshop, uh, sort of a workshop, open house type of event, where we'll have some boards there and staff there to answer questions about the components of the plan. Uh, and also there'll be some staff there to, to walk through some presentations uh, of the material and, and take some Q&A uh, to help. And again, comments uh, through uh, June 1st. So based on the feedback, we will finalize the draft plan, and draft EIR, and, and the preparation is for uh, MTC and get that in consideration to adopt the plan uh, this summer. So we're aiming for uh, in July for that. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy at this point to take any uh, questions or, or comments. Hi. Um, my name is Diane Burst. I'm the mayor of Port Madera. Uh, I have two comments that I'd like to make, and I, I appreciate any uh, clarification you can offer on both. The first one is that um, I believe the numbers in Port Madera are uh, really much 
too high, and I'm sure you anticipated those kinds of comments from other officeholders here, here in Marin. However, I'd like to illustrate just why I think it's really much too high for such a small community. Port of Madera has about three square miles of land, not including the portion of our city that's literally bay water. Um, you have allocated to us new, a new households number of 500 and new jobs of 700. As a comparison, Orinda is 12 square miles, so four times the land area, and yet they were only allocated 200 new households. I don't understand that. I understand you said that in your scenario, the, the closer in Bayside communities were allocated a little bit more, and then the further you out, you went out um, further from the centers of employment, they got a little bit less and less. But that is really a, a very skewed, it, it's a difference that I think is, is not explained by, um, by that ex explanation of how the scenarios um, differ between Bayside communities and suburb suburbs further out. Again, Corte Madera, Madera, three square miles, 500 new households. Arinda, 12 square miles, 200 new households. So that's my first comment. And then my second comment uh, is that last year when you were going through the initial scenarios and submitting um, or asking for comments, I submitted a Public Records Act request as an individual, not as an elected, for all of the inputs that made up Corte Madera's numbers I did not get that information. Instead, I was offered a USB drive with every single input into the urban sim model, which would mean that in order for me to go through it and understand the calculations for Corte Madera, I would have to personally become an expert in urban sim. That, in my mind, is not what transparency is about, and it's not what the leaders of our communities expect. We need to be able to explain to our constituents what is going on in local government and regional government. And um, I would really hope that I, we could get better from MTCNA Bay. Thank you. In, in terms of the Public uh, Records Act request, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with that request. And, and I think um, we'd be open to working together to clarify exactly what you need and we'll get it to you. Thank um, you. So, so that's fine. We can work on that. In, in terms of the, um, you know, the numbers between communities in, in Corte Madera and Orinda, um, you know, all I can say, I guess, about that is that, um, you know, we, we did work, obviously, with the Corte Madera planning director, kind of sat down and went through all of the assumptions. So that is something that we did between draft and final. Um, I know in terms of the household growth numbers, um, they, they were lowered a bit between the, the draft and the final, so slightly lower. Um, and, you know, in terms of the process that we undertake, and I, I definitely understand and acknowledge um, the issue of looking at um, a community like Orinda uh, vis-a-vis Corte Madera. And, you know, there's no simple answer to that question, but I, but I think that a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, the fact that, you know, some communities are potentially positioned for some development. We have an economic model that looks at those possibilities, um, and it's obviously it's a regional model. Um, and so but we're happy to work with you and talk more about the assumptions that go into that. Uh, but Matt, um, we have talked at ABAC and, and MTC as well that an economic model may not be necessarily the type that we should use for uh, especially projecting for housing and especially with the arena coming up this next cycle, I know that we're going to be looking at some alternative uh, modeling. Uh, so. Sure. Urban Sims, we did have a, uh, a session in San Francisco on it, um, and there uh, there are some issues with Urban Sims. Um, so, you know, part of it is when, when we when we build those models, we, we start with assumptions on on local plans and zoning, and you know I think we also need to, to keep working as we as we build these models to dive into the details of what the local plans and the zoning are from the beginning. And you know it's a parcel-based model. It's a big region, and you know I think moving forward we just have to work on um, you know doing better to sort of clarify the local plans in the zone and really get down into the details with the local communities. And I think we're very willing to do that as we move forward. I, th I think there are some constraints though in urban sense. For example, we do not allow development over 
20% grade. Um, and so there's really no way to factor that into the urban sims. So you may have <coughs> only a small pocket of a huge parcel for development, and it's hard to adjust it. But I and, those, and those are the types of details that I think, you know, that I think we, can, we can work with with, with local communities. We can build them into our process. So it's, a, it, it's an evolution, and, and I think every time we do it, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm not, I'm just a member of the public, but um, just. <laughs> just? <laughs> We're here to serve you. Um, long term, what's the end game? And I mean, we're doing this in 20 year increments, it sounds like, but at some point, we have limited resources here. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to think that two or three generations from now, we're going to have twice as many jobs, twice as many demands for housing and so forth, and we still have people from ABAG and MTC telling us that we need more. So at some point, you had, you know, you added enough salt to the soup, and it's not palatable anymore. Nobody's going to want to live here, and you've lost what makes Marin great and what makes the Bay Area great. So can you talk to that? Well, we, we do these plans every four years, you know, and so, uh, you know, once we're done with this one in July, probably by the end of the calendar year, we're going to start the next one. And, you know, again, it's, it, it's, an, evolving, it's an evolving process. Um, they are long range, and it's tricky to forecast the future. Um, you know, the way that we start these plans typically is, is we start by looking at um, sort of economic factors nationally and globally and sort of exogenous things that are happening to this region. Um, to sort of understand from a regional perspective, what can we expect in terms of population growth based on those economic factors and what can we expect for job growth. And you know, what this plan really does, it, it, it's an attempt to accommodate that future. Um, and, you know, I think that every time that we do this, and again, I mentioned it's the second time we've actually done a joint RTP and SCS. And so, you know, I think we're still learning um, about how to do this. We're still learning about the best way to forecast, given that forecasting is very tricky. Um, I think we're still learning uh, the best way to work directly with local jurisdictions, and reach out to the public, being <coughs> and early on in the process uh, to make sure that our assumptions are workable. Um, and, you know, I guess my pledge to you is that, you know, moving forward through this planning process and getting into the next one, which will likely mm -hmm. start towards the end of this year, um, that will, you know, keep evolving um, and keep getting better. Uh, but, you know, the forecast that we create for these plans starts very early in the process. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty open process. We put that in front of our committees. And that's a really good time to really start getting involved um, in terms of some of those housing and jobs numbers that we anticipate um, regionally. And actually, I think the, the, there's, there's many moments to kind of have that conversation. Uh, I'm also a member of the public. What, what is the date uh, deadline for comments? Uh, June 1st. June 1st. So we're meeting in Mill Valley on May 20th. May 20th. So will the public, the 450, 50,000 and Moran has 10 days to get your comments? Well, the plan was, re the plan was released um, on April 1st. So the, so the, plan, is, the plan is available. Um, All right. So the, you can send comments in now. Um, so we're about, we're about midway through the process. Okay. Is there a possibility to get an earlier uh, uh, public forum or anything? Uh, earlier than the one we scheduled for May 20th? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm out of turn here. Uh, I just, I think that's asking a lot for the public to respond in that compressed amount of time. That's the reason I'm here tonight filming, but uh, it'd be great to have an official voice, perhaps from TAM or, or someone else, uh, so the public can have a chance to, to digest what you're proposing. What, what, what we try to do, and I think I mentioned before, that um, we're, we're embarking now on our, our, our third round of outreach for, for this plan. Um, so actually, when we start the planning process, we, we do a round of outreach in all nine counties. Then we did a second round of outreach, and that was, um, when last Commissioner Eklund mentioned the last workshop, that, we, that was part of that second outreach period. And that was uh, largely to walk people through the scenario process. So at that point, we had 
uh, different scenarios of, of housing and jobs. Uh, and that was a forum to kind of go through that with people. Um, you know, now that we've adopted a preferred scenario, this is the third round to kind of take people through um, the final plan and the action plan and the components of, of what's in there. Um, but, you know, I, I totally acknowledge that, you know, we need to keep thinking about different ways to involve the public and make sure there's plenty of time. You know, I will say that um, we're, we're, we have to do a, a, a 45 day comment period for this plan and we actually are doing 60. Um, so from that perspective, we're, we are trying to elongate it and make it easier for the public to, to make comments, but we can always do better. <coughs> But uh, Stephen, I'll take your comment back though, because I agree with you that there's not enough time. And actually, I think the plan wasn't available on the internet until I think close to the mid part of April. I, especially so. because Marin on Plan Bay Area One submitted the most comments uh, right. the first time. It, right. This is going to have a lot of interest right. in Marin, I have no doubt. Right, yeah. I hope so. I hope a lot of people come on the 20th and yeah. hope you'll help. Uh, publicize it. Sure. Hi, I'm Andrew from Nevada. <clears throat> Is this the uh, first actual very large scale application of the urban SIMS modeling? In this region, yes. Um, in terms of in terms of this region, we we started the process in the last plan in the EIR when it was adopted in 2013, so that was a, kind of a bit of a road test for the urban sim model. Um, so this is, I guess, sort of the second application, sort of more of a full-scale application for this plan. Um, it, it was a model that was uh, that was put together by UC Berkeley. It is, uh, it is used um, in other parts of the country and in the world. In terms of doing land use modeling, I would say it's it's state of the practice. I, I won't call it necessarily state of the art. Um, and you know, it is fairly adaptable though. Um, you are able to populate it um, with a lot of assumptions. And I think it kind of gets back to um, you know, the more that you can really drill into local planning, local zoning, perhaps other ordinances happening on the local level that we may not know about, that we have to talk to local officials to really get the details. You know, we can populate the model with all that detail. Um, and so I think a lot of it is, I think it's very powerful and can be very transparent um, if we start early and really involve the locals in the process. Can be. <clears throat> the other areas of the country and the numbers uh, of uh, population that were involved, uh, where are those, how, how many millions of people were involved in that and how many iterations have taken place in other areas already? Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's used in the Pacific Northwest. I believe that Portland's looking at it. Phoenix has been using it. And these are so these are metro areas. Metropolitan um, rather than that's right. Nine county. Well, it's, they're 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 MPO regional planning agencies, so they'd be our counterparts in other metro regions of the country. Um, there is application to use it on on the local level as well. You could use it on a smaller geographic area or a larger geographic area, but. Um, in terms of MTC and ABAG's use of the model, this is not the first metropolitan region to use it. But it is used in other regions of the country. So this is really the first large-scale iteration of the model, model in the Bay Area. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct to say, yeah. So you've been saying that it will be refined, and uh, if we get enough local input, it will be refined. And so what it's really doing is it's learning as it goes. We have a model that learns as it goes. And right now, it doesn't know very much about the local uh, area, the smaller towns. Well, I will say that it's it, it starts with the local plans and the zone. <clears throat> and so um, there was a lot of work at the outset to populate the model with that information. So I think where it gets a little bit trickier is that in some cases, local plans may be outdated. So some of them may be old, they may be 20 or 30 years old. And even though we may have a zoning designation in some way in a town, that doesn't necessarily mean it's that way when you get on the ground. And I think those are some of the details that we have to continue to learn and to make sure we populate the model with. I mean, it's, it's a parcel-based model, and it's a big region. Um, so I, I think as we move through this process and evolve, it, it's sort of getting some of those details on the front end built in. Okay, 
I'm also interested in following up on the end game uh, question. We definitely have a model that, to me, seems to be being uh, driven primarily by the economic boom. Uh, it seems to have been driven by the uh, nascent boom and now the uh, well-fledged boom in Silicon Valley. And it appears to me that as long as economic development continues to boom, and as long as this area continues to attract industry and other financial investment, then the rest of the population will be required to accommodate that. Now, this is a model that is primarily an economic <coughs> model. And this economic model has no ending. There is no end in sight. There is nothing about a carrying capacity for an area. And definitely the Bay Area is fragile, and it has a definite carrying capacity. We don't want to be Singapore. <coughs> we don't want to be Hong Kong. And we don't want to have 25-story high-rises in every uh, area which is now suburban. Yes, uh, Jim Andres from Corte Madeira. Uh, given climate change, sea level rise, why are you putting housing along the bay? Why don't you put it in <coughs> and uphill? Because I know in my town, a quarter of it, a couple of levees came out. We aren't going to have housing in a quarter of the town. You know, I, I think I think one of the one of the things that we have to start looking at more closely in this planning process is the priority development areas that we have and the priority conservation areas that we have, and take a deep dive into the resiliency of those areas. Um, to deal with things like sea level rise, whether it's liquefaction zones, flooding, you name it. So, I mean, I think you're exactly correct. I was actually in a conversation today with, with staff back at the office about this exact issue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we did a PDA assessment um, of a sample of the PDAs a couple of years ago. Um, mostly looked at the market potential of a lot of these areas um, in terms of, of what they could do for housing and jobs. You know, I think that, you know, the thought is to potentially expand that type of analysis but also include a resilience lens to the PDA. So the next time we do an assessment, it's more comprehensive in scope. We're not just looking at market potential, but we're also making sure those areas are resilient um, to the climate change factors. So I, I think you're exactly right. I think we're heading in that direction. questions? I'd just like to remind everybody to please sign the sign-in sheet here so we can keep a record of everyone that's been here. Uh, I think we have 15 of our local electeds here, so thank you all very much for coming out and members of the public adding to the discussion. And Matt, um, it sounds like we're going to see more of you on May 20th with a broader uh, kind of a workshop and uh, open house, so please everyone that's uh, here, um, I want to spread the word amongst uh, your fellow electeds and um, residents here to attend that workshop on May 20th. And again, thanks a lot, Matt, for coming by, and uh, that concludes uh, the workshop this evening. The TAM board meeting will be starting in about 15 minutes. So, thank you. Thank you.